Hi everyone, uh, this is Kirsten at NASDAD and we're gonna give it maybe one more minute. People are still joining and then we'll get started. Thanks. Okay, great. I was probably about 30 seconds, but it looks like we have quite a few people here. So we're going to get started. Um, hello, and welcome from wherever you all are joining today. Um, again, my name is Kirsten. I am a member of the drug user health team here at NASDAD. Um, we are super excited to have um, you know, worked with Reframe Health and Justice to facilitate this webinar. Um, for those of you who are not familiar, I'm going to take a minute to say a little bit more about NASDAD and who we are and what we do, um, and then we'll get into the webinar on trans-inclusive and trans-centered harm reduction services. Next slide. Great, thanks. Um, so yeah, uh, NASDAD is it's kind of a... Um, wonky acronym, the National Alliance of State and Territorial AIDS Directors. And we are a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization that is membership-based. Uh, our members are um, sort of public health, health department, HIV and hepatitis officials. Uh, and we work with um, those people across the country to provide technical assistance, capacity building, and do policy and advocacy work related to ending the intersecting epidemics of HIV and viral hepatitis. Um, our work has, has evolved over the last few years, I'd say, to focus more and more on drug user health and on harm reduction, um, recognizing how, how integral those are to our goals in, in ending HIV and viral hepatitis. And um, the drug user health team has is doing more work with uh, with community-based and grassroots programs, um, not just health departments, and really trying to kind of form a bridge between those community programs and the um, public health system. So uh, again, we're really honored to host this webinar today in partnership with Reframe Health and Justice and Sasanka um, to talk about creating harm reduction services that are inclusive of and that center trans people and communities. This is the second in a series of three webinars that we are hosting with Reframe. Uh, the first was in October, and that one focused on uh, sex worker-centered harm reduction. And the third webinar will take place in early 2021. Um, and that one will discuss how we can do better in working with criminalized populations and with survivors of violence. Um, recognizing that a lot of the systems that we have in place to address violence don't uh, really serve marginalized people uh, very well and, and can themselves actually cause and perpetuate harm. And on that note, I, I want to acknowledge that today, uh, December 17th, marks the International Day to End Violence Against Sex Workers. One of the things that I've really appreciated about working with Sasanka and with Reframe is their explicitly anti-violence approach to harm reduction. Um, and I think violence prevention has, you know, always been a crucial focus um, among, you know, trans and queer folks, people engaged in sex work, in communities of color, and, and harm reduction work happening there. And, and I think the movement and our public health partners have a lot to learn from um, people who've been doing that work and surviving and taking care of each other, navigating really challenging circumstances for a long time. Uh, and we have a responsibility to acknowledge that and build on that work. So with that, uh, I'm going to hand it over to Sasanka Janadasa, who will facilitate the webinar and be joined by some super knowledgeable, um, really incredible panelists. 
Sasanka is a strategist working to end the oppression and criminalization of people who experience stigma and violence. As a consultant, Sasanka has developed racial equity curricula, trained health departments on safer drug use, uh, including a health department I used to work for, um, built capacity for nonprofits on reducing risks for people trading sex, and facilitated intermovement conversations on harm reduction, healing, racial justice, and criminalization. They are committed to developing anti-carceral solutions to addressing social injustices, particularly for trans and queer people facing racial oppression. At the moment, Sasanka is also an addiction and overdose fellow for the American Health Initiative at the Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. And I'll hand it to you. Thanks so much, Sasanka. Thank you so much. Then it's always lovely to work with you and I'm really um, happy to be here. So yes, I'm Susanka. Um, I'm a partner at Reframe Health and Justice. Susanka, so, I don't know if it's my um, issue, but I can't hear you. So I don't know if there's something wrong with your audio. And health and safety for people in the sex trade. We all have personal and or professional experience um, working with or uh, living through working in the sex trade. And these are um, sort of the ideas and harm reduction principles that are really important to us. And I think it's important to mention that we are aligned with all movements to defend and celebrate all Black lives, and particularly Black trans lives, um, as I'll talk about more here today. Uh, it's really important to me in the context of international data and violence against sex workers to note that um, trans sex workers are facing some of the most violence within the sex working community. And it's a really uh, important for us to center them in today's conversation about trans inclusive and trans centered harm reduction. So no matter where you are today, um, wherever in the world you are tuning into this webinar, if we could just take one moment um, to just breathe and honor those we have lost this year and all these past years due to violence against sex workers. Just one second. Thank you. Thank you for participating in that with me. And I am going to um, get us started. So I'm going to read this quote for you all from Audre Lorde that helps me sort of define why it's important to think about specific marginalized groups when we are talking about harm reduction. And it's from Audre Lorde, if I didn't define myself for myself, I would be crunched into other people's fantasies for me and eaten alive. And the reason why I mention this is harm reduction to me is a philosophy and a practice that's rooted in evidence-based public health, but it's also about self-determination and agency and bodily autonomy. And so it's so crucial that we give folks who have been sort of oppressed and marginalized by systems of racism and transphobia and sexism and classism and give people the opportunity to really define what harm reduction looks like for themselves. Um, and that's what we hope to do today. We'll give you some brief grounding and what uh, transcultural humility looks like. This isn't going to be a trans 101, so if you're hoping for that out of today, it's just we don't have the time and space to go through like a full what is what are trans issues um, and what are what is the trans community in today's workshop, but I really do recommend that if you're not as familiar. I will give us a couple minutes of an introduction into some basic concepts, just if you are really new to the topic. Again, that's not going to be the context of the whole webinar. We're really going to focus on what trans inclusive and trans centered harm reduction might look like. And after we go through this sort of cultural humility intro, we will talk about um, what trans communities might specifically need in our harm reduction programs. And then we'll have a panel um, with some amazing panelists who've been working in trans centered and trans inclusive harm reduction for quite a long time. All right, we're going to get started on our little intro here. So what does transgender mean? So everyone is assigned a gender at birth. Um, that's based on a number of things, but particularly it's an examination of like physical sexual characteristics. So based on that sort of out, outside examination, 
um, of a baby's body, they are assigned a gender, and that gender sort of follows them along um, in their life. So trans people don't identify with the gender they're assigned at birth. So they might identify as a different gender that is familiar to you, like man or woman, um, or they might identify as genders, as different genders, non-binary, um, gender non-conforming, gender queer. There's many, many, many genders. So I can't list all of them for you today, but trans people are people who don't identify with the gender they're assigned at birth. And cisgender people do identify with the gender they're assigned at birth. So when you're born, if you're assigned um, female at birth and you identify as a woman, you'd typically be understood to be cisgender. This is a really simplistic explanation. There's a lot more nuance to this, but I think that'll give you some basics for understanding where we're going from here. So what are the systems that affect trans people? So cissexism describes systems that prioritize cisgender people at the expense of transgender people. Um, and so that's like an overall system that says that cisgender people are more valuable or um, we normalize cisgender people and say that trans people are different and less valuable. Transphobia describes systems that develop around like fear or hatred of trans people. And these systems, together inform a lot of our public responses to HIV, homelessness, domestic violence. Um, some ways that we see this showing up, for example, in homelessness is our systems aren't built to recognize and understand and include trans people. So they're often don't have a space to go in terms of a shelter or they might experience violence or harassment within shelters or there aren't specific systems that are set up to understand that trans people are more likely to experience homelessness and we don't have a specific system set up despite knowing that fact. So that's just different ways that cissexism and transphobia might show up um, in our sort of social service and public response system. So just a little more context on this concept of non-binary and gender non-conforming. So not all people identify as men or women. Um, that is including you know, all trans folks. Not, trans folks don't necessarily identify as trans men or trans women um, or men or women. They might identify along a different sort of category of genders. You can be neither, both, fluid, flexible, something else altogether. It really is dependent on the person. So one thing that I talk about with trans cultural humility is that you just really can't assume what people's genders are by looking at them. So what a lot of people, us, um, sort of assume gender based on what we call gender expression. So we look at sort of a combination of what people are wearing and the way that they do their hair and what they put on their face. And we assemble all those things together and we say, oh, I think I understand what your gender is. Um, but people's gender is really something that's internal to them and understood to them. And it can't really be defined by somebody's gender expression. So the reason it's really important to think about non-binary and gender non-conforming people um, when we're talking about uh, transcultural humility is this can affect, you know, whether people have the capacity to fill out legal forms in a way that aligns with how they identify. Um, this can affect your ability to uh, access gender segregated spaces. For example, a lot of domestic violence shelters um, are sex segregated or gender segregated. And for non-binary folks, it can be really hard to access those spaces. It can also be really hard for um, trans men and trans women to access these spaces as well because they're sometimes seen as gender non-conforming, even when they do have like a really strong sense of gender identity being along those lines of men or women. So there's all these different ways that um, trans folks are harmed by the systems that we have in front of us. And I've just given you some really limited examples here, um, but in harm reduction in particular, it's really crucial for us to think about how we're centering and including trans folks in the spaces. And I say centering and including um, for a couple of reasons. So having a trans-centered harm reduction program is something that's built by and for trans folks. And having a trans-inclusive harm reduction um, might look like we, all of our staff are trained and prepared to support trans people, but it's not necessarily by and for trans folks. And I think both are really critical spaces that all communities need to have, but they do look slightly different. And the terminology is less important than the idea there. Like, do we have spaces in which our harm reduction programs understand and respond to trans folks' needs? And also, do we have spaces that are particularly 
led and run by trans folks. And both are really important. So specific challenges that trans communities might face. Um, trans people are more likely to experience homelessness, unemployment, intimate partner violence, interpersonal violence due to cissexism and transphobia. Um, family rejection is a huge reason that trans folks are experiencing homelessness. Discrimination is a huge reason that trans folks are experiencing unemployment. Um, and stigma and intimate partner violence and criminalization um, are huge reasons that are, are drivers of those violences. There are, there's harassment and abuse and transphobia within shelters and workplaces and social services. So it's really important that our harm reduction spaces are able to hold folks and hold those values around autonomy, around client centeredness, around agency, because for a lot of trans folks are not getting it in a lot of other spaces. And so our harm reduction programs have this opportunity to really be a space where people can feel seen and feel centered and be able to address their health needs on their own terms. So I'm just going to run some stats for you all so that you understand how serious of, a, of an issue this is. The rate of homelessness around trans folks, and this is from 2016. Um, this is the US Transgender Survey, uh, which is run as like the only national survey of trans folks that, um, that exists at this moment. And it's run by the National Center for Transgender Equality. The rate of homelessness among trans folks is three times that of the general population. 70% of trans people trying to access a shelter have reported mistreatment, including getting kicked out due to being trans, harassment, and assault. 33% um, of trans folks have had negative experiences when seeing a healthcare provider. I think that's so critical. I know that I've, as long as I've worked in harm reduction, um, harm reduction programs and providers are often some of the first spaces that people are experiencing any type of medical care. Um, it's like over like the course of their um, substance use. So I just think it's so critical that we understand that trans folks experience so many negative experiences with seeing healthcare providers and that our harm reduction programs can't become another space where that happens. And also just that, you know, just like everyone else, <laughs> we know in lots of different communities, trans folks use drugs, right? So there's um, the US Trans Survey found that there's a 29% lifetime use of illicit drugs among trans folks and communities. And respondents who are currently um, in the underground economy were nearly nine times as likely than those who are not to have used illicit drugs within the past month. And the framing of illicit drugs, I think, is less helpful than understanding. It's about interaction with the criminal legal system. So if you're in an underground economy, you're maybe working a job that isn't sanctioned by the, the sort of general economy, um, you're more likely to use um, criminalized drugs than those who are not working in the underground economy. So it's really important that we you, uh, understand and think critically um, about how trans folks are using drugs. And I'm gonna talk about that next. So what do trans communities need specifically? Quick, <laughs> trans-specific harm reduction. Um, the first thing is don't assume. So I know I'm doing this whole webinar where we talk about, you know, what do trans communities need? What does trans-inclusive and trans-censored harm reduction look like? But I think the most important thing is to not assume, especially about in your specific jurisdiction or city or locality, you don't assume what trans folks need. Like talk to people. Um, get a work with the community to actually understand like what are folks looking for. I think that goes for all harm reduction, but particularly harm reduction of those who are sort of socially stigmatized and um, state stigmatized as well. Um, tailored supplies for specific substances. We have some great panelists who will talk to this as well, but often within sort of specific communities where people have to build community with each other. Um, because of social marginalization, there might be a drug of choice that is more likely to come up in specific communities so you can tailor your supplies. Um, tailored supplies for trans people who are trading sex. Uh, there are trans people who are trading sex who might need things like safer sex supplies or different types of safer sex supplies that you might provide um, non-trans sex workers. So that's another thing to consider. Safer hormone injection supplies. So some trans folks get their hormones um, not from a medical provider directly. They might buy it from like a street pharmacist. 
So there are ways that we can keep people safer through um, the injection supplies um, that we provide as well. And then there are sort of more broader professional development um, things that we can do to be trans inclusive in our harm reduction program. So education on the specific needs of local communities, making sure our linkage to care um, is actually been vetted by trans folks. So sometimes we make referrals in harm reduction programs, and we have to make sure to vet those really carefully to make sure that those um, resources are also trans inclusive and people haven't had experiences of transphobia within those programs because you could cause more harm by giving somebody a referral to a place that doesn't actually have the competencies necessary to give that person the social services that they need. Um, hire trans people into outreach and leadership positions. I can't stress this enough. Um, I think that we need to do a better job in harm reduction of not just hiring people from different communities into outreach positions in order to access their communities. We need to also hire folks into leadership and really prioritize their leadership. And so when we're doing trans centered harm reduction, we can't just have people working in outreach roles, which are usually the least paid roles in our harm reduction programs as well. We, want, we really wanna focus on building up leadership skills and making sure that people can be in leadership positions. Part of that for me is also valuing different types of leadership. And it's not just about, you know, does this person have experience grant writing, but are they somebody who can really understand the needs of a community and how do we put that first when we're vetting leadership in our harm reduction program? And then finally, staff cultural humility training and ongoing education, like the needs of trans folks shift all the time. You can't just take one training and be culturally competent. It really is about like ongoing education, ongoing learning, and really the prioritizing of trans leadership in this work will really advance us um, in being able to do that. So that was a really sort of quick spiel on my account. Um, the reason for that is we just have this phenomenal panel that I want to get to and hear from, and um, I'm really excited to get us started. All right, so on our panel, um, our first panelist is Jessica Martinez. Uh, Jessica is a DC resident trans woman who has dedicated her time to advocating for people both at home and abroad, um, working on numerous political campaigns and as a member of the Democratic National Committee. Jessica spent much of her time canvassing and campaigning for LGBT and economic equality, receiving her bachelor's in 2018 from Georgia Washington University in American Studies, much of her academic life has been spent understanding power hierarchies, race relations, LGBT identity, and state policy. Now working for HIP, Jessica is working towards reducing harm to the meth using community in DC, as well as destigmatizing addiction and behavioral health in the District of Columbia. In her spare time, she's an avid gamer, as well as enjoys freestyling and photography. And I'm really excited to introduce you to Jessica. Hi everyone, can you see me and hear me? Um, very nice to see you all today. I'm very excited to talk to you about this subject. Um, so if we can go to my slides really quick. Hey everyone, this is Kirsten. It looks like um, maybe Jessica froze. Um, so I'm not sure, Sasanka, are you there? I'm here. Um, while we're figuring what's going on with Jess, uh, Jessica, I think that we could maybe go on to Rox, if Rox is ready, um, and then come back to Jessica when we can figure out what's going on with her tech. Hey, Does can you both hear and see me? Yes, hi Milan. Hi, <laughs> how are you love? Good, good to see you. So um, we're in the panel right now and um, it looks like Jessica's video cut out for a second. So we're gonna go to Ross's presentation and then yours and then we'll come back to Jessica. Does that sound good? Perfect. 
perfect. Okay, I can't wait. All right, Rax, I'm gonna to go to your slides now if that works for you. Okay, everyone, I'm really excited to introduce you to Rax and I'm excited for when Jessica comes back um, as well. So Rox Anderson is an award-winning community organizer and activist who has been working in social services for more than 25 years. Um, Rox Anderson has received awards that include the 2018 Bush Fellowship, 2016 Grand Marshal for Twin Cities Pride, um, University of Minnesota Community Excellence Award, the Beautiful Humans Award for Outstanding Broadcast Journalism focusing on BIPOC LGBTQIA communities, Lavender Magazine's 100 Fab Community Organizer Award, Twin Cities Black Pride Community Service Award for Diversity and Inclusion. Rox has been featured in Rolling Stone Magazine, Curve Magazine, Lavender Magazine, Star Tribune, as well as several radio and TV shows. Currently, Rox is on um, an on-air DJ and host for two local community radio stations, KRSM and KFAI, helps run the Minnesota Transgender Health Coalition, and is the co-founder and director of Rare Productions, a multimedia arts and entertainment company focusing on produ producing and promoting trans and queer artists of color. Y'all are so accomplished. It is so amazing to hear all about this. Um, Rox, I'm gonna run your slides for you so we can get started. All right. First, I have to give a huge shout out to Milan and the House of Tulips. That show was fire. Fire, fire, fire. It was amazing. Thank you, thank you, thank you for whatever you did to help make that happen. I, I loved it. Uh, thanks everybody for having me. Um, I'm Rox with the Minnesota Transgender Health Coalition. I like they, them pronouns, please. Um, and uh, MTHC is an organization who his mission is to improve the healthcare access and the quality of healthcare received uh, by transgender and gender nonconforming people through education, resources, and advocacy. Uh, NTHC carries out our mission through amazing volunteers and um, allied community organizers um, and activists who uh, like to throw in. Um, and we do that through um, healthcare um, providers really being engaged with individual groups in our community, um, specifically touching um, uh, communities, uh, parts of our community that might be a little more um, uh, displaced or, or left out of the mix, like uh, Two-Spirit Society and some realms of uh, uh, gender nonconforming folks. Thanks for working my slides too. Uh, so at our core values, uh, racial, social, and economic justice is where we rest. Uh, equal access to quality healthcare for trans communities um, and individuals in those communities. Our goal has always been to work for and recognize that we are part of a multi-issue movement that includes racial and gender equity. Um, this slide is of one of our longtime uh, shot clinic clients, uh, just fresh out of getting a new batch of hormones and super excited about it. So our programs, uh, our core programs are the shot clinic uh, and syringe uh, exchange and then um, uh, support groups. Uh, and the syringe exchange works on a peer-to-peer -peer, uh, shot sharing, uh, shot helping, shot assistance kind of measure. We train our shot callers, as we call them, uh, for a period of uh, two to three months, depending on what their skill set is coming in. Um, and um, those folks uh, practice on oranges, 
uh, and other lovely fruit uh, as they learn all about how to give a shot. Uh, and then we uh, allow them to begin practicing on the other shot callers and the, and the um, actual folks who are running the clinic. Um, so basically what folks need to be able to participate in the syringe exchange and shot service is your um, prescription. So we ask folks to bring in their prescriptions so we can kind of validate them um, and make sure that their prescription matches or we know that it doesn't match and why uh, their prescription with their ID. Um, and then we take a brief intake with them and then they're set as a client. Um, they can pick their unique name and identifier from that point on uh, and, and we do that by a combination of initials and date of birth. Uh, but folks can identify as Minnie Mouse if they want. And so we'll do MN and whatever year Minnie Mouse was born as your code. Um, and so uh, folks can have some anonymity in, in that service if they want. Um, anybody can use uh, the shot clinic and syringe exchange. You don't have to be an uh, uh, injection drug user that's of illicit nature. Um, and you also don't have to be injecting hormones. Uh, so we have uh, a few clients that get a vitamin B uh, shot uh, and, uh, monthly. Uh, so you don't have to ha be on hormones. It will also do an assist that's intramuscular or subcutaneous to anybody. Uh, these are some of our amazing clients and uh, shot callers and folks hanging out uh, at Pride. Uh, we had an art team made this giant macrame, or not macrame, um, what do you call it, puppety type thing, cluster Paris um, syringe that we rode down the middle of the Pride parade route um, that got lots of love. So good. Uh, we do support groups and we meet with different uh, segments of our community and some trans masculine, some trans femme, some gender non-conforming, BIPOC group. Uh, for a while we had a parents group um, and um, we also provide space for other organizers that are working in trans community. So we've given space to the Minnesota Two-Spirit Society, uh, Transformation Church, Reclaim, the GLBT Host Home Program, um, the famed Tyson and the FCC campaign. Uh, we also do some community engagement events, uh, Twin Cities Pride, of course, uh, POC Pride, of course. Um, Trans Jam is an event that we do after Trans Day of Remembrance to give folks um, an opportunity to have joy. Uh, and it's just a, it's a dance. You know, we have the images in the background, the names are, are going across the screen. Um, and, but we've all just come from a Trans Day of Remembrance uh, ceremony, and so this is a place for folks to uh, bring joy and kind of de-escalate, debrief, um, and share their grief with everybody else in the community in a fun kind of levity having way. Um, and then we do Black, Brown, and Queer All Over, which is an outdoor annual event. Um, and then we uh, work with the city of Minneapolis to uh, put on their Trans Equity Summit and take a key role in the, in the planning of that and sit on the council and the work group. Is this pictures our shot clinic logo and folks hanging out at Pride? Awesome. And I think the last one was just my contact. Thank you so much for having me. Amazing. Oh, can you also see my screen? Hello? See your screen, but not the screen share. Okay, great. I will move it back. Um, so it sounds like we've had some audio issues, so I'm just hooking up my headphones right now so you all can hear me. 
this is my facilitator voice of hello everybody let's make sure that Hey, can you, can you all hear you? me? Yes, I can hear you, Jessica. And yes, I can hear you now, Sasanka. That is amazing. Thank you all. This is the Zoom universe that we live in. Um, I'm going to go back into presentation mode so that we can all see the slideshow. Thank you so much, Rox. It was so good to hear from you um, about your program. We're going to go on to Milan and then we are going to um, come back to Jessica in just a second here. Um, and you all, this is being recorded, so you're going to be able to see these slides um, as well uh, later. So you're going to be able to access all this content, um, contact information as well. Okay, wonderful. Um, it is my greatest honor and pleasure to introduce you all to Milan Nicole Shuri, um, who is a New Orleans native and founding member of Breakout, where she first became a youth organizer. In direct response to the killings of Black transgender women, um, Sherry created the Black Trans, hashtag Black Trans Lives Matter campaign and organized the first New Orleans Trans March, led by transgender and gender non-conforming youths of color and founded NOLA's Trans March of Resilience, Milan has also helped the Department of Justice reduce racial and gender profiling by the NOPD and has contributed to a Human Rights Watch report linking discriminatory policing to HIV transmission. As the recipient of the 2013 NOLA Unity Award and the 2015 Rising Star Award presented by EQLA Quality, uh, Milan has been involved with the American Bar Association's Opening Doors Project and featured on PBS's In the Life and in Philadelphia Magazine. She's a national board member of Positively Trans, served as the co-coordinator and outreach specialist at the Trans Equity Project in Philadelphia, and now is the co-director of the House of Tulip. Um, and Milan and I have actually known each other for a minute when we were both HIV 360 fellows of the Human Rights Campaign um, as well. So I'm really excited to have Milan here to talk a little bit about um, her work at the House of Tulip and just overall um, on trans issues and harm reduction. So thank you, Milan, excited to have you. Oh, I can't hear you, Milan. Can you all hear Milan? Hold on. Can you hear me now? Yes. Awesome, awesome. I'm sorry, I was muted for a second. Um, again, thank you, Sasaka, for reaching out and um, including and being intentional of having my voice here today. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, y'all, I don't have any slides to show y'all, um, as y'all know, or if you don't. Um, my name is Melanie Koshari. I am the founder as well as the co-executive director of the House of Tulip. Um, House of Tulip literally um, was birthed this year um, during the very beginning of this pandemic. Um, and so um, just a little bit about myself, right? Um, I am a New Orleans native. Um, I, I'm a Black trans woman also living with HIV. And so um, let's just dive in as far as with House of Tulip. Um, House of Tulip um, was birthed out of a, a desperate need here in New Orleans when we looked at as far as housing um, and how housing affects many of us, especially within the TGNC community. Um, during the very beginning of the pandemic, uh, myself, including um, the Mariah Moore, who is the co-executive director, as well as Dylan Wagaspec, um, we sat down and um, we had a conversation and trying to get ahead of um, the pandemic, right? Because we also knew that um, the pandemic was gonna affect many folks within our community, especially here in New Orleans, knowing that many of our community members do work in the service industry. So whether it's the bars, the restaurants or the clubs, many of our TGNC folks actually thrive and actually make a living working in these spaces. And so when the city went into um, into a shutdown, 
um, we launched a GoFundMe where we was able to raise over $20,000 to assist TGNC folks um, with um, during this crisis, whether it be um, assisting them with food, assisting them to pay their rent, because unfortunately, even during the pandemic, landlords were still trying to evict folks. Um, we helped assist folks with medication. But after um, two or three months into the pandemic, when you know we started to go into phase two, um, we did see um, the, the request as far as with housing. Um, hold on, I'm sorry, there's a lot going on in my office. I'm not sure if y'all can hear it in the background. Um, but we, we noticed um, that they were a high volume of requests when it came down to housing um, during the pandemic. And so that's what we focused our lens on. And so when we looked at the landscape here in New Orleans, um, we realized when it came down to housing, everything had a barrier. Um, you know, the Covenant House, you have to be a youth. You know, certain places you have to be HIV positive. Other places you have to be a, 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 a victim of domestic. Um, and so we wanted to create a zero barrier housing solutions to our community where you didn't have to be HIV positive to access this resource. You didn't have to be a youth to access this resource. You didn't have to be trafficked um, to access this resource. And you didn't, so we wanted, we thought it was very important just to create a zero barrier housing solution for our TGNC folks. Um, six months later, I am, I am happy and I am pleased to say that we have secured a property. Um, we have secured an office space um, and we are in the process of securing another property, fingers crossed, um, that's gonna be able to provide even more housing um, for our community here. Um, as a woman who who is living with HIV, who, have, who is experiencing incarceration, who have experienced all these disparities, um, I understood that housing is so important to many of us. And if we have housing, you know, um, when we think about like language to care, um, keeping folks into care, um, if folks just had a place where they didn't have to worry about where I'm gonna lay my head, they are more able to thrive and excel in this, in this reality. And so, um, yeah, we wanted to be able to create that space and where there wasn't where there wasn't that resource, we created it. And um yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Juan. I can't wait to people already have questions for you in the QA, you and Rock. So I'm really excited to be able to direct that. But now we're gonna hear from Jessica. Um, and then uh, we will get to our, our QA. Oh, oh, sorry. Can you all see the slides? Yeah. Hi. Let Hi. me just go to your slides. Um, yeah, my internet came back. Um, I feel gaslit by it, so I'm just gonna use my phone. Um and I do remember <laughs> my slides pretty much. So um the first one should be we are who we serve. And whenever you're on that, let me know because I'm on my phone. Sorry. I'm on that. Yes. Okay, we are who we serve. Um, okay, so back when um what I was trying to say before, um, as a trans person in DC, uh, I work as a harm reductionist. So um harm reduction is what I do every single day, um, whether it's handing out needles to drug users or to diabetics or handing out condoms to sex workers. Um, a lot of my clients uh, range from, you know, all over the gender spectrum. Um, there's no specific race I serve. There's no specific gender. I serve anyone in DC who requires harm reduction services and counseling. Um, one of the things I wanted to point out is if you look on our staff page, about a third of us identify as trans um, or under the umbrella of trans. So that can include people that are genderqueer, non-binary, um, anything that falls under the trans or gender non-conforming umbrella. Um, moving on to the next slide, we have a mandatory 40-hour cultural competency and sensitivity training. The reason for this is because we don't want a single one of our volunteers or outreach workers 
to be out on the street and not know how to properly engage with our community members. So understanding the basic theory of gender is one of the requirements for working at HIP, but also being a volunteer at HIP. So it doesn't matter if you come into us in a volunteer capacity or if we've hired you as full-time staff, at some point, everybody has to sit down for our Gender 101, where we go over very simple concepts like what is gender nonconforming? What is the binary? <laughs> you know, what is cissexism and other topics that Sasanka discussed. This is also really important because a lot of our staff are trans. Um, that one third of our staff is our full time staff. It doesn't include our peers or secondaries, which are secondary exchangers our members in the community who collect syringes and give them to us to exchange so we can give them syringes to give back to the community. So, you know, we, if we didn't understand how to properly communicate with our fellow coworkers, um, there would be absolutely no way that we would be able to properly engage with our clients, right? So we like to start from the beginning. So if you're in an organization that provides harm reduction services and you're looking around and you're not seeing many trans people around, working around you, maybe that's some food for thought. Um, I also want to note that while um, not every trans individual has done sex work, if I recall correctly, in the National Transgender Demographic Survey that there should be on that slide, about 10% of trans individuals have experienced some form of working in sex work to provide for themselves. So when you think about that in itself, handing out condoms as a public health issue, suddenly, you know, it's not so cis-centric. If you come to realize that a lot of trans people have to do things like sex work to simply survive, especially in a city like DC. So that's just one thing that I want to know. Moving on, HIPS also helps trans people acquire their hormones. We can't give hormone prescriptions to people. We are not a pharmacy. Um, that, you know, that's a whole nother can of worms. But we do provide free clinical services. So when we have a client that comes to us and says, I want to start my estrogen injection, where do I go? We can provide them for free clinical services, a referral, a doctor's prescription, and they can go and pick up their estrogen. Uh, we also help people get linked to insurance. Um, so again, even though we can't physically hand out estrogen to people, we make sure that at every step of the way, we are advocating for our clients to ensure that they're gendered properly, to make sure that they feel respected, that they have access and equal access to medical care and in the forms that honestly aren't equal for trans people if you don't have medicaid and a doctor who's willing to see you for free it's very difficult to get your hormones and at times um just personally but also things that i hear from my trans clients there are doctors that they can go see that could give them the prescription um and they're not very kind they're not very understanding and because of that alienation they feel with the medical system they feel less inclined to go through a more legal medical space and will go to the street economy like Sasanka was talking about acquiring um estrogen on the street for their hormones so one of the things that HIPS also does is try to educate people on how to do a proper injection and there should be a slide I think it's the one after the third one um, where we have this whole demonstration on how to prepare an intramuscular injection site and how to administer an intramuscular injection super 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 important um, if you are trans and possibly taking hormones uh, there is a very good probability you're going to be using a needle so not only does hips provide the clean needles and help people with their shots but we also give the means for people to be able to do their shots. And if you want to talk about gender affirming care, that's definitely it. <laughs> um, and moving on, um, one of the last points that I wanted to touch on was in our data, one of the issues that we were noticing was that the Department of Health had a very like binary way of viewing gender. And it's not just the Department of Health, it's the medical care system, it's the health system here in the United States is not created for the capacity of trans people. So one point I wanted to end on was we tailored our data sheets 
to include expression as well as someone's spoken gender identity. So if I'm talking to someone and it's a quick interaction and I don't have a chance to ask them, hey, um, how do you identify as your gender? Um, or they don't understand what the question is. I can simply like list what I noticed their expression was and ideally, right, if I can't figure it out, then I just put non-binary um, or, or some other gender non-conforming expression because I don't want to assume what someone's gender is. But for reporting purposes, I need to know, like, the gender of the clients I'm interacting with. So instead of having just a male or female, we expanded it to include other gender identities as well as identities that are beyond the binary. So that actually changed the way that we were able to look at data with these two health because all of a sudden we're taking into consideration different gender identities that aren't just trans female or trans male. Um, so that's about it. <laughs> I know I came late. Sorry, guys, but my audio cut out and I'm open to questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jessica. HIPS is a wonderful program and um, the work that Jessica is doing there is really amazing, thinking about how do we center um, trans folks at all levels, right, in all of our services. We have trans outreach and we also center trans people um, in the in the non-specific outreach, right, to say, hey, like trans people uh, can and do use substances, trans people can and do sex work, and they also use hormones, and there's all these different ways that we can be interacting with trans individuals and communities, and we need to center trans folks in, in all of that. So thank you all so much. Um, we are gonna open up for questions now. So you can send questions um, in the chat and I will get alerted about those questions. But I'm gonna start with, um, with one of my own here. And I'm actually gonna stop sharing my screen because I think it's causing more problems than it's causing solutions. So just give me one second to stop the sharing there. But my uh, first question for you all today um, is what has been the successes and challenges of collaborating in your work with state and local health departments or state and local entities? What have been the successes or challenges of that work? And that's for all of you. So um, I'll just quickly go and say hi, this is Shokik again. Um, that yeah, that, like I think that was a big challenge for us was trying to, as trans people, figure out a new methodology of reporting data to the Department of Health. Um, and I say this with the like most love, right? Because like there's not a bunch of trans people running around the Department of Health. I'm sure there are some. I haven't met everyone that works at DOH in DC, but um, you know, trying to think of like, hey, when we report this data to you, could we do it? this way so we could include more people and then to just have like the state be like yes this makes sense of course you know it, it kind of was like a very big success because it's like oh yes like you know we can look at this in different ways and include more people and like you know work together with our government allies to pump out great services and great reporting um so that's like, you know, I mean, I know I already spoke on that, but that was very exciting for me um, last year and this year. Yeah, thank you for that, Jessica. That's, I think that you're downplaying a little, that's a rare success to be able to <laughs> actually um, have the uh, government accommodate that. So that's awesome. Um, I think I saw you, Milan, you might have something here. I'll repeat the questions this time. Um, what have been the successes and challenges of collaborating with your state or local health department? Um, woo. So, of course, um, I am in New Orleans, and so um, I'm in the South, and so it can be very challenging, um, it, and it has been challenging, still continuing. Um, oh, some of the things that Oh, so let me let me start with maybe our successes, and then I get you to fall into the challenges. Um, so um, what I'm seeing as far as the advantage that we have here is that you know folks are intentionally starting to trust like Black trans leadership, 
And so I'm starting to see, like, especially here, like in New Orleans, where we specifically work, like, with our, one of our biggest medical providers here is like Crescent Care. And so knowing that Crescent Care it has um, has a large um, um, what should I say? Um, has a quite a few trans staff um, that really like gears a lot of their um, programming and relationship building within community. So I think that that's great. Um, challenging, how could I, because I y'all, you know, I want to be respectful. Um, some of the challenges I would be I don't really even know how to, I don't know how to quite frame it just quite yet, Sasaka. I, I don't, yeah. That's, yeah, so that's I, totally fine. I, I'll jump back in. <laughs> okay. Rox, do you want to um, jump in on this? Sure. Um, I would say um, the collection of data around um, STDs, HIV, um, and Hep C. Specifically, when we first started, they, there was no trans category. It was male and female. So while we would give them the data as a trans identity, they would roll it up into whatever assigned sex somebody had at birth, which really us off and really ticked off our clients so we sent i think something like 500 letters to the cdc um, about their inability to capture that data accurately um that that was really frustrating um and also resulted in a success um also dealing with the police has been very frustrating, especially around pride and, and BIPOC events around that. Um, and that's been both with our local pride agency and um, with uh, state and local uh, police department. Um, so I, those are the two things that come off right off the top of my head, uh, not to mention all the things that Milan has shared around housing uh, and then and equities that come along with that. And those are always state systems, uh, local systems that uh, create the barriers there. Well, I guess banking also, banking and mortgage. But, you know, um, yeah, so I think those are our big three. And I think our big success is really getting the city of Minneapolis to agree to um, any new builds that they do and any new leases that they enter into must include uh, gender expansive bathroom options. Yeah, that's excellent. Um, Milan, I just wanted to note too that people in the chat told you that you don't have to be shy about dragging the health department. So if you want to, you can go ahead. Um, the health department is very tired. Um, we know they've been, I mean, especially, I guess, you know, for me, um, you know, I learned a lot, especially taking, going through the HIV 360 fellowship, um, you know, um, Yeah, so one of the things that I had found very troubling, especially a, a, a trans woman, you know, when I when we was doing the HIV 3CC fellowship, um, I kind of struggled um, in a sense because at the time I wasn't someone who was living with HIV. And so that that has changed, you know, um, some time later. And so one of the things that was hard for me, like transitioning from Philadelphia to New Orleans was getting linked back into care. And um, I thought it would be like, I honestly thought it would be as simple as me coming in, just set up an appointment, but it wasn't. Um, I struggled um, tremendously, even with how, you know, for one, again, CDC not even recognizing trans women as women, right? And then categorizing trans women into this MSM category which is, you know, we know that when it comes out to the HIV data, that's all fucked up, excuse my French and language. Um, I think that is very inaccurate, um, especially knowing that my experience moving from Philadelphia 
um, coming into New Orleans, getting linked back into care, but also being considered like a, a, a new um, a new number, right? If that really makes any sense. Um, how I can say was like, um, yeah, I mean, CDC is just very problematic. I mean, I just think that even when it comes down to how they how they determine like who gets funded, right? And you know the the deliverables, and you know, so CDC just I I can care less to really um really work with the CDC, but yeah, 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 that's very fair. I think that you all raised some really good points about like sort of collaborating institutions, so like who the health department is collaborating with, and like how that can affect care, and then. I think that point you made just now, Milan, about um, like sort of transitioning different between spaces and different cities and areas, that linkage to care model um, is really lacking in terms of infrastructure. Um, and I think that's such an important point to make when it comes to trans folks in particular, but also tra trans and queer folks is that <laughs> move a lot, right? <laughs> like we move a lot, that's like a big, part of you know you know being part of an underground economy potentially or family rejection so those sort of gaps in care really affect people's capacity to actually access you know care as they're being moved or shuttled from place to place yeah like for example um i forget that i was out of town i was like in maybe like birmingham um, and I ended up running out of my meds. So I was like, well, let me just go to Walgreens and, you know, get my prescription. And then I had an issue accessing my meds being out of town because now I'm out of coverage. And so I wasn't even able to access. And I thought that it was such, I was just mind blown. Cause I'm just like, are you serious? Like trans people, people with HIV, we travel, we move, we, and certain, so in order, I literally remember me being going into like really getting overwhelmed and my anxiety starting to trigger because here it is, I'm in a whole nother city. I don't have access to my medication. Um, and just the anxiety around like, you know, how hard I work just to become undetectable. And so understanding like, you know, I just didn't want to, so I, yeah, that that was a situation that was just like, you know, really had me on top of like, you know, well, when I travel, when I leave, I need to make sure that all my prescriptions is up to date. Let me make sure that, you know, I have everything that I need so I don't run into a situation where, um, you know, and there was another situation in, in Pittsburgh, like literally in the beginning um, of the pandemic, um, you know, I was literally sheltered in Pittsburgh at the time and was afraid to kind of like travel and move to the airports. You know, I was like, you know, how do I get my medication? But thankfully, thank, thankfully for my partner um, who advocated for me to get my medication, um, I was able to get it. But I could just, I know that's not the case for everyone. And so, you know, when we talk about like, you know, again, linkage to care, but keeping folks into care and some of those barriers that comes along with that, like, like as far as, again, housing is a, a, a huge thing. If I don't have a place to safely store my medication. I have to worry about like not living in a, or the environment or the space that I'm living in is unsafe or uncomfortable. The most like so all of that plays like you know a huge factor into you know our overall health so yeah yeah thank you thank you all we <laughs> we spent so much time talking that we actually only have time for like one or two questions so i'm going to ask them from the from the audience here um i'm going to ask two questions and you all can choose to take it um how you want um my two questions are, the first question is, uh, I am prioritizing, uh, my, one of the main things I'm prioritizing in my work is to implement a trans harm reduction program and facilitate education services for our trans community. Where would you suggest I begin to, in a, assessing the needs of our community and how to discover the gaps in care and what's needed? So that's question one. Um, 
And then the second question is, I want to push my clinic to be more trans inclusive in their harm reduction outreach. Do you have any recommendations on how to do that? So the first question is about outreach. And the second question is about assessing what the gaps in care are and how are we going to assess within the community. Um, before I get to you two, because I can actually see you, I'm just going to ask Jessica, because she's on the phone, if she wants to um, share anything on those two questions. about assessing the need of trans people in your community. Um, probably your best bet would be if you're in a city, um, I, I guess I can only give the best advice to like a urban area for a rural area. You might have to get a little more creative, but I would probably go and do outreach late at night um, when people are usually out and about doing um, sex work. And yeah, let me not beat around the bush. Um, when people are doing sex work, uh, when people are selling sex is typically past midnight. So um, what I recommend is uh, 7-Eleven's always open 24 hours, a lot of coffee um, tips because we have an established client base and we also have name recognition in DC. So it's a little bit easier. But if you're just starting out like, one of the main ways that it gets interactions with people on the street is by giving them candy. You would not believe how many people will walk up to a man at 2 a.m. and take candy from strangers. Um, it's a little horrifying sometimes when I think about it uh, because that's everything that my parents said not to do. But um, really, you can go out on the streets and just by giving people a hot chocolate, especially like it's cold out right now, just give people hot chocolate and start asking them like what their needs are. And eventually you're gonna run into a trans person. I know that like, that seems like, oh, but Jessica, like where are all the trans people? Well, there is like no magic answer to where trans people are. Trans people are everywhere. So if you're trying to find a demographic to like expand harm reduction services, you're probably going to have to one, be out late at night in pretty sketchy places, um, but never fear. If you're a harm reductionist, usually you'll be fine. I haven't had any reason to call the police ever on an outreach, <laughs> um, as much as people would like to argue otherwise. Um, and it's gonna be a lot of seeking out. It's gonna be a lot of like nitty gritty, you know, getting out in the community. I guess some people would refer to this as gorilla. <laughs> um, and you're gonna have to go out to parks uh, late at night um you know or during the day and see who's around and start asking questions um probably the best recommendation i would say is also try to like if you're trying to collect some form of data create like a data sheet with categories that are easily quantifiable so like for example um you could do an age range of 18 to 24 and then 25 to 40 and so on and so forth um, so that way you can have like something that you can report, especially if you're doing grant work, because usually they want you to report some form of data or like show some deliverable outcome. Yeah, thank you, Jessica. I want to make sure that we can hear from Milan and Rox here too, um, before we close out. Okay, I'm gonna make it really, really brief. Although candy is great, Jessica, um, that's not gonna work for girls down here. They want coin. They want money. They need to be compensated for their time. Um, Cause I can't tell you how many times I've done outreach and um, time is money. Time is valuable. You know, if they're doing a survey for you, if they're doing any type of data collection, then you need to be compensating these individuals. Um, and although candy and condoms and all those things are great, I always come to encourage people, maybe come with your coin and, and you can get a better, you know, outcome with these individuals. Two, um go approach it with the for us by us kind of model i i saw it be like as far as a huge success when you have pharma sex workers engaging with individuals who are currently doing sex work um that has been um an advantage i've seen a lot within agencies who are doing harm reduction specifically engaging with sex work um i understand as a pharma sex worker myself who knows a sex worker better than i do right and so to be able to go out and build that relationship um, where it was a lot easier compared to some white cisgender counterpart or employee or, you know, so I think if you have any trans people 
who have actively or even formally engaged in sex work, that is always great to be able to, you know, have those individuals who are like, you know, the specialists um, when it comes out to your outreach team. And so that's that's pretty much it. That's perfect. Thank you, Milan. Um, Rox, any closing comments or thoughts on either of those outreach or assessing um, needs? Uh, I, I would just concur. Always come with the coin, candy and all that other candy condoms and conversation is played out people are, people are done with that we need money to survive so if you're not compensating folks that are doing outreach and connection into communities that you need to be reaching to meet your grant goals um, then you don't have authentic relationship um, and the the folks the community members are going to know that and the outreach workers are going to know that and the outreach workers aren't going to invite the community members into your stuff because it's not going to be safe um i would say the same thing around bathroom and building navigation if if trans people can't go to the bathroom and feel comfortable doing that then you shouldn't be have them at your place um, and then um, I think, you know, we're often really quick to um, have trans folks engage in the arts and entertainment um, world. And I think that's another place where we're shorting our community um, and people want to give uh, folks $50 or $25 to come and, you know, do an event for them and call it like name recognition and, oh, we don't have 5,000 people. Everybody's going to know you. No don't do it don't do it don't do it you need to be paying people a living wage and fifty dollars to show up to your gala where you're going to make three hundred thousand dollars is not cool it's not fair and it's not equitable um it takes a lot to look fabulous on stage we're talking hair makeup wigs um you know the dress the shoes like all that it takes a lot and if you're doing some kind of like you know music accompany you know more and more artists are actually like singing and not lip syncing those those are real talents and so we should never be paying our especially BIPOC trans artists, anything less than a hundred bucks to show up on a stage. And it really should be anything less than 250 if you want to get it for real, because they got to take a cab, they got to get there, they got to get home. So, so those are the things that I would offer, fair and equitable pay all the way around. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much um, for that. I don't know if you all can hear me because my little rainbow wheel of death just went on. Um, but thank you all so much for for sharing your thoughts on on this really important topic. I think that if I can take anything main away from there, it's trans folks are valuable in leadership. They're not just spectacle. Pay them their money <laughs> and make sure that we're centering them in everything we do. So thank you all for um, for this fantastic, fantastic presentation. I'm gonna turn it over to Kirsten. Yeah, thank you so much. I, I feel kind of bad, like I'm cutting into this great conversation, but it's all of a sudden like 5.15. Um, so unfortunately we have to leave it here, but I'm getting the message, I think kind of loud and clear from some of the questions that came up, that there's a lot of interest in um, kind of how to reach out to the trans community and how to better, better tailor services and in just hearing more and, and receiving more support around that. So, um, Sasanka, I don't know if you can put it in presentation mode because the slide is showing up very small. But um, I just want to give a quick plug for the National Harm Reduction Technical Assistance Center um, through NASTAD. And there we go. Yay. Oh, it disappeared. <laughs> Um, so the, the TA Center is um, there, available, free TA for um, community-based harm reduction programs, SSPs. Um, we provide consultation on a number of different um, areas in terms of kind of policy, program design, uh, capacity building, training, 
um, tailoring services, and we work with um, great folks like Reframe and other consultants um, when you know we at NASA don't don't have the specific expertise that you're looking for. Um, so you can reach out at druguserhealthta at nasdaq.org. Um, or to find us on the NASDAQ Drug User Health webpage to find out more. Um, and the next slide, I think, is just a real quick um, visualization about the variety of ways that you can receive technical assistance for free from NASDAQ. So if you're working in a state uh, territorial or CDC-funded jurisdictional health department, um, there are ways for you to receive um, capacity building from NASDAQ, um, or if you're a CDC-funded CBO in the U.S. South, um, and if you're working uh, in a hepatitis program as well um, nationwide, you can receive TA through the HEPTAC platform. Um, and then the final piece is the TA Center, which I already mentioned. Um, so please reach out uh, for, for the questions you brought up during this webinar and more. Um, and that's it for us today. This is our last sort of drug user health event for 2020. Um, so much appreciation to, to everyone who showed up, but especially to um, those that we heard from today. Milan, Sasanka, Jess, uh, Rox, thank you. Thank you so much um, for being here. And I hope everyone takes good care and have a great rest of the year. Bye, everyone. Bye.